Beyond the shadow of a doubt, we now know that the president must be impeached. And to your question, I'm very grateful that Speaker Pelosi has decided to move forward, that it looks like um, the, the majority, not only of her members, but some Republicans are beginning to consider this as well. In other words, they'll place the future of this country before their political future, before any polling, before their prospects in the next election. And that's the way, at the end of the day, if we're gonna make it, this country has to work. And so I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about the path that we're on now. That conversation happened just a few blocks away from where I'm sitting. That's 2020 presidential contender Beto O'Rourke in conversation with my colleague Garrett Hake here at the Texas Tribune Festival discussing impeachment on the stage. Meanwhile, President Trump is pushing back against accusations of wrongdoing in a closed-door event at the U.S. mission to the United Nations in New York. Well, the president was caught on camera at that event declaring war on Democrats and suggesting the whistleblower's sources committed treason. Take a listen to what the president had to say. We're in a war. These people are sick. They're sick. And nobody's called it out like I do. I want to know who's the person that gave the whistleblower? Who's the person that gave the whistleblower the information? Because that's close to a spy. You know what we used to do in the old days when we were smart, right? The spies and treason, right? We used to handle it a little differently than we do now. <laughs> A wholly different speech than many people in that audience expected. With me now is former Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, here with me uh, in Austin. Let me first have you react to that. We haven't yet spoken today about what all of this means about the sanctity of whistleblower complaints and how what's happened here changes uh, that. When you hear the President of the United States there talking about what used to be done in the old days, old days to traitors, what does that say to you? How do we move on from here when it comes to, the again, the sanctity of a whistleblower's right. complaint? David, first of all, thanks for having me Thank here in me. Austin. Um, in a free and open society, in a democracy, um, whistleblower protections are fundamental. They're fundamental to checks and balances, separation of powers, as painful and as disconcerting as it can be. If you're in the executive branch and you have a whistleblower, it's fundamental that in a situation where uh, a seasoned federal official feels that he or she has no place to go but the other branch of government that there be legal protections in place for that kind of person. I've dealt with the whistleblower law and there are times when it's unpleasant, it's a setback, uh, just like having an inspector general, as your, you know, an independent inspector general in your department, but it in the end is a healthy component of a democratic form of government. The president's remarks are, frankly, not helpful. Uh, I've been saying now for some time that uh, a, a leaders, those who command a microphone, those who aspire to be our leaders, have a responsibility to engage in civil dialogue, lower the temperature in some of the political rhetoric we're seeing right now, because words have consequences. People do listen to their leaders. And so uh, I, don't, I don't believe the comments were helpful. We can't have a conversation about what we've learned over these last couple of weeks, what we learned in the Washington Post this morning about this meeting that President Trump took with Sergei Kislyak and Sergei Lavrov uh, in the Oval Office without talking about right. election security and election integrity in this country. And what the Post is reporting this morning is that President Trump said casually he doesn't think that there was election interference in 2016, and fundamentally it doesn't matter because it's something that we, the United States, has done uh, yes. in the past. David. Your reaction to that, again, is this is the marquee thing uh, that is driving all of this. David, uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, there can be no complete line of defense. And when it comes to bad cyber behavior by nation states, uh, we have to put in place sufficient deterrence to make the behavior cost prohibitive. Nation states, whether they're communist regimes, dictatorships, monarchies, or democracies, all tend to function in a certain basic way, which is that they will respond to sufficient deterrence if you make the behavior cross prohibitive. Um, that comment, if true, goes in the other direction and it signals to the Russian government, hey, if you do this again, it won't be a big deal for me, the president. 
uh, which undermines, by the way, his own administration, his own administration's effort at imposing additional sanctions on the Russian government for their behavior in 2016. You helmed an agency that needed the free flow of information, yes, within uh, the, the pool of people who should have it, but people needed access to it. And so as you read uh, what was alleged in that whistleblower complaint about how a readout of a phone call was compartmentalized in something or in a place yes. where it shouldn't have been, how do you react to that? For, for whatever reason that yeah. was done, um, and that is being investigated and that's playing out, how do you react to the, to the way that that has been changed? Or well, you could, you could spin that a number of ways, yeah. which is, uh, one way it could be spun and might well be spun is somebody realized that the document contained something very controversial. They were worried it was going to leak, and so they placed it in a file that had uh, where fewer people would have access to it. So that's, you know, without it being motivated by some sort of political cover. That's one well, interpretation one of events. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it is also the case that it's fundamental to classifications law. When you classify something or when you withhold something from FOIA, a request under the Freedom of Information Act, that it not be done so uh, for, to avoid political embarrassment. That's, that's set forth in the law. Let me ask you lastly here just about what's happened this week and your reaction to it. You're somebody who spent a lot of time in Washington at the Defense Department, at the Department of Homeland Security. You, you, know, you know the way the city works. Um, what the House Speaker did was a grave, it was an, a grave and important step that she took. Your reaction to it, do you think fundamentally it's a good thing that she's authorized or begun this formal impeachment? Interview? David, my reaction is this. I think the House Democrats had no choice. And especially since the Mueller report, the president has basically thumbed his nose at Congress by um, refusing to accept their subpoenas, refusing to accept congressional oversight, this expansive assertion of executive privilege, and this latest revelation comes on the heels of that to the point where they had no choice. They felt like they had no choice. I think it's important for the American public to remember, however this turns out, in the Senate, yeah. and it requires a two-thirds vote to convict, there's an election in 13 months. And that is the opportunity for change. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me, or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.